Hi, I'm David Rousseau of the Kaiser Family Foundation and chair of the Media Impact Funders Board. On behalf of my colleagues on the board, the MIF staff, and our wonderful program committee who contributed so much time and energy to bring you this year's event, welcome to the 2021 Journalism Funders Gathering. Even though none of us thought we'd still be doing this in Zoom boxes in October 2021, the virtual format allows many more of us to participate and might not have been able to travel this fall. And this year's registration is one of the largest ever at over 100. I still remember my first of these meetings about a decade ago where fewer than 20 of us gathered to compare notes, brainstorm collaborations, and refine our approaches to media funding. Thankfully, our field has grown significantly over the past decade, but not as fast as the need for new models to support the trusted journalism our nation so desperately needs in so many quarters. This year's annual gathering is aimed at strengthening connections among us all and giving us each the time and space to discuss our current work with each other. This year's terrific agenda features a mix of plenaries and breakout sessions where we can all dive deeper on subjects of particular interest. We wanna thank several sponsors for supporting this year's gathering. Special thanks go to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Knight Foundation, the Lundfest Institute for Journalism, the Lumina Foundation, and the Facebook Journalism Project. Thanks also to those of you who are members of Media Impact Funders. Through your support, MIF's wonderful staff are able to bring us programming like this and so much else throughout the year. And a huge thank you to my fellow Journalism Funders Program Committee members for helping the MIF team organize the content and speakers for this fantastic conference. You'll have an opportunity to see them throughout the next two days since they will be opening and closing sessions and leading some of the small group discussions. Our first plenary today dives into one of the main challenges facing not only the journalism industry, but democracy as a whole. How can we revive local news? As a community of funders, we know we can't fix everything and in many ways we don't have to. While the changing ecosystem has often been lamented as a collapse, the speakers you'll meet shortly are hopeful. Local news is reinventing and reimagining itself in many ways. As more funders invest in local journalism, it's important that we continue to align our strategies to impact the field that's navigating inequities, threats from big tech and waves of disinformation. While each of us have different strategies and approaches, how do we re-examine power and redefine resources and value to create media that communities need? Most importantly, how do we care for everyone, our grantees, partners, communities, and one another during that re-examination? And now, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Hannah Hassan, award-winning spoken word poet, speaker, storyteller, and inspirer, to provide some grounding for our discussion today. She'll be sharing a bit of narrative and a spoken word piece, which will focus on building community in challenging times. Thank you, welcome, and here's Hannah. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Hannah Hassan. I am joining you from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm so, so happy to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I read an article this weekend in the Wall Street Journal um, about storytelling, um, and it said that when we experience stories together, um, we don't have to be in the same room, but in community, when we're experiencing the same stories, our hearts beat as one, and that took my breath away. So um, we are not all in the same room together, but we are sharing space and time together. Um, as long as we stay on the same page and don't let ourselves get distracted, we will beat, our hearts will beat as one uh, during this time that we have together today. So I invite you to uh, settle yourself in and uh, to experience a little bit of some of my story and some spoken word poetry as we prepare ourselves to uh, receive a very rich experience today. When I was a child, my father started the first Juneteenth celebration in my small rural North Carolina town. This was about 30 years ago. Juneteenth as an entity, an actual thing, was not something that was acknowledged or celebrated in my hometown prior to that, but he, my father, was a man well before his time. A freedom fighter, lover of community, and believer in changing, elevating, and challenging the narrative. So I learned about Juneteenth way back in the early 90s, and I've celebrated it in community, small and large, since then. I could have never imagined that I would see a year like 2020 in my lifetime. 
a global pandemic that would change the world as we knew it, that would require all of us to shelter in place in our homes or the places that we felt the most safe. And, and all of that during a time of racial unrest, protests, and intense community organizing and strategizing. I have an active imagination, and even I could not have worked up this plot twist in my head or in my heart. So 2020 required that we all rethink and reimagine and rework everything that we thought we knew, especially in regards to loving on and supporting our communities, all of our communities, and most definitely the ones that exist within the margins the ones that exist in underfunded and underrepresented spaces, the ones where the most vulnerable and resilient of our communities live, work, play, and everything else. So a group here in Charlotte revisioned what honoring and celebrating Juneteenth could mean in 2020 during a global pandemic and in the midst of the fight for justice and equality of Black lives in this country. That group planned a car contained parade for Juneteenth in one of the blackest areas of Charlotte. <clears throat> Beatty's Ford Road stretches through the heart of our city. It's a historically black neighborhood that is home to many of our elders. Back in the 1920s, when the all black historic Brooklyn neighborhood of Charlotte was displaced due to redlining, redistricting, gentrification, you know, the, the usual cocktail of black neighborhood erasure. Back then, many of those families moved to Beatty's Ford Road. Present day, that area, the Beatty's Ford Road area is home to many small black businesses. It's home to Johnson C. Smith, the only historically black university in Charlotte, to many black banks, some of the biggest black churches and, and religious spaces. Also, there's a part of that area that has very heavy crime numbers. It's, it's heavily policed. The schools leave a lot to be desired. There are quite a few pockets of extreme poverty. And it's extremely close to uptown Charlotte, which is our downtown area, the center of our city. So there's a lot of building happening and the displacement has begun there too. But there are leaders and community groups that are intent on ensuring that part of our home, this part of our home is safe and accessible and beautiful for the folks who have been there for years. They want to ensure that the history stays intact and that the future of that community is bright. So Juneteenth weekend, June 2020 in Charlotte was all about Beatty's Ford Road. The word went out, we will meet up at the YMCA in our cars, bring signs and decorate your vehicle, prepare yourself and your family to drive through the parade route through one of the blackest streets in the city. Bring your colors, your pride, bring your joy. And as I prepared for Juneteenth, I was instantly eight years old again, getting myself ready for a celebration of freedom, preparing my heart and my spirit for shared time and space with my community, even though it be during a global pandemic, even though we'd be confined to our cars, it felt like something important and special was about to take place. In true 2020 form, I placed an order for crafting goods online and utilized curbside pickup. And then I drove over to our family home and met with my nieces and my nephew. They are all about the same age that I was when I experienced my very first Juneteenth. I talked to them about Juneteenth, explained the Emancipation Proclamation, discussed why the day was so important to us. I told them about their own history and how their Paul Paul started the Juneteenth celebration in our hometown. And I reminded them that they were living history. I turned on the Juneteenth playlist that I had made. Freedom songs blared through the living room as they focused intently on their art. They decorated their poster board with messages like young, black, and free, and all black is beautiful. And they chose colors like black and red and green and gold to decorate. And, and when they were ready, we filled two cars. It was me and, and my husband and my nieces and nephew and my mom and my auntie, and we headed out to Beatty's Ford Road. When we got out there, we lined our cars up in the procession. 
There were other cars with signs on them as well. Some painted messages of freedom. Some had their top dropped. There were some black cowboys and cowgirls and cow people on horses. And the energy, it was so big and, and beautiful and, and so black. It was a feeling that could only be felt if you felt it. And as the processional took off, we followed behind with our windows down, music blaring, signs of freedom lining our cars, fists raised in the air and out the windows, beeping the entire way down Beatty's Ford Road. And the streets were lined with people, other Black people with smiles, huge, huge smiles, and their fists in the air, yelling, happy Juneteenth, happy Freedom Day. And though we were in our cars, we, we felt them, the other people in their cars, the family on the horses, the folks lining the streets, we were all one that afternoon. And it was one of the most electrifying, freeing and community oriented moments I have felt since back in the 90s when we had our first Juneteenth in my small hometown. So as we drove away from the parade, I remember holding on to a feeling of sadness. I couldn't shake it and I couldn't place it, but it felt like the bottom dropped out once we turned onto the highway. But as a family, we raved about our time together and then settled into the night in the comfort of our homes. Many from our city continued to celebrate the holiday as the weekend continued. Later Friday night and Saturday and Sunday, folks went out to Beatty's Ford Road, music play, there were food and drinks and, and folks were outside um, just enjoying each other and celebrating. And that's understandable, especially during a time where many of us have been stuck inside and hadn't seen so many of our neighbors. I watched the festi festivities unfold on Facebook Lives and videos and social media posts from home. And then I woke up Monday morning and logged onto Facebook and I would see the unthinkable. Throughout the weekend, Gemini, who's a leader and activist in our community, he had been out on Beatty's Ford Road for all the festivities and, and he often goes live on Facebook to share what's happening in the community. As I clicked on the video of his live from the night before, my heart dropped. There was a shooting on Beatty's Ford Road a mass shooting. Gemini captured much of the aftermath on video. Folks running and screaming, bodies on the ground, police officers with military style weapons drawn. It was chaos. And it was said that uh, uh, people pulled up in, in all black and, and they were in, in vehicles and they jumped out and shot into the crowd using assault weapons. And 10 people were injured and four people died. Of those who lost their lives, no one was over 40. The shooters have still not been identified to this day. And just like that, what was one of the most innovative, celebratory, and meaningful Juneteenths that our city has ever seen is now referred to as the Juneteenth Massacre on Beatty's Ford Road. A few weeks later, I found myself back on Beatty's Ford Road Another organization had gathered a pretty large group of visual artists together. They decided to paint murals in different spots in that area. They also partnered with other artists and groups like the symphony. And I was asked to come out and share poetry while artists from the symphony played and a mural was being painted. So on a warm summer, early Sunday afternoon, a group of artists use their brushes and spray cans. A group of musicians use their instruments and the breath from their bodies. And a spoken word poet used her wor words and her voice to breathe life back into Beatty's Ford Road. To remind our city that even in the saddest of spaces, during the darkest of times, after tragedy and catastrophe, light is there. Love is there. There is always space to build again, to grow again, to find our way through again. The truth of existing in this space that we call home, in this country, in whatever state you might live in, in our cities and towns, is that we are all seeking to build community that works for all. And history has told us time and time again that this is not easy. 
There is no one size fits all here. There are no quick answers. Well, well, maybe. Maybe the answer is innovation, trying new ways, open our hearts and our minds to what liberation for all can look like, giving, giving from our strengths, learning from our mistakes, and picking ourselves up again and again because we need each other and we have to be willing to fight for each other. I will leave you today with a poem. I was commissioned last year to write a poem for a conference for one of our federal departments uh, that provides grants to organizations across the country who do grassroots work um, in their communities. They told me that these organizations have faced so many challenges th this year with having to rework and rethink their processes and how they serve community during this unprecedented time. And they asked me to speak to that experience. So I researched many of the organizations and I saw that they are doing what so many people that I know and love are doing at this time, throwing away what was and leaning all the way into what can be. And it's been yielding some great results. So this, this poem is an adaptation of that poem. It's a love letter to them and all of the organizers and elected officials and artists and journalists and leaders and funders and just everyday human beings who are giving for the sake of us, for the sake of our community. March 2020, the world broke us open, broke us into each other. Life gave unexpected, unforgiving, unprecedented, yet we persisted. Forged forward in the face of the unknown, we grabbed hold of each other and soldiered on, and you, you continue to open doors and build programs with courage. You face trials and tribulations that could have broken a less determined, less purpose-filled person. You continue to create, continue to build. The world found itself in uncharted waters, yet you continued to fill community. You found ways to seek opportunities, created new processes when new was your only option, opted out of using the old ways to design pathways and solve problems because the problems of the world require innovation, require bold steps towards freedom. The people of your world needed you to show up. They needed someone to believe in some hope to cling on to, to rainbow at the end of the storm. They needed new processes and procedures to be born. They needed you to believe that they were worth investing in. They needed some glimmer of hope. They needed to know that the world would be better when it opened back up, when it opened itself into them again. They needed you to show up. They needed you to have a plan. And you did, in the midst of your own personal unsurety, when everything around you commanded you to stop, you realized that elevating our community takes giving every single thing that you've got, even when hearts are breaking all around you, even when uncertainty and catastrophe surround you, you remember that our world needs you to build alliances, to foster growth, to champion change, to speak the stories with honor, to find resources to ease the hurt and the pain and in weathering this storm. You built a new blueprint for our lives to be reborn. You create a new manual that responds directly to how we cope in the face of disaster of how we pull together in the moment, do what needs to be done for the moment, and assess what works after. This is a journey to the future of our communities, a moment in time that has changed the way we work for and with each other. This was a building moment, a rebuilding moment, forever elevating the many ways that we organize and feel for each other. And if there is any lesson to be learned, 
any takeaways from the challenges and victories that have been gifted us is that there is power when we build together what didn't break us, elevated us. Look at how this has lifted us. So we continue, so we continue to fight for all of the people and places and organizations that have hoisted our communities up on their shoulders, that shoulder the weight of progress, of upward mobility, of moving forward. And we keep going, keep working, and keep building, knocking down barriers that might come in our way with courage and resilience. You see, tough times don't last always, but tough leaders do connected to the world around us and the resources that ground us, we protect and support us and people like us, we push us through. Thank you. Woo, Hannah. <laughs> I'm feeling the earth, I'm feeling our ancestors. Um, and I truly believe that all of our hearts are beating as one. Thank you so, so much. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Roxanne Stafford and I'm the Managing Director of the Night Lynn Fest Local News Transformation Fund. And I'm so proud that my roots are in North Carolina, just like mm -hmm. Hannah. Um, Hannah, there's so much energy, I think, going through all of us after being in community with you in these pieces. I'm just wondering maybe briefly, uh, you could share one way that stories help us build. Um, they help us see the humanity in each other. Uh, I think that oftentimes we're running through life, right? And we're doing mm -hmm. everything that we can to just make it from one day to the next. Um, but when we really sit and bear witness to each other's experiences through story, um, we, we really, we see humanity and, and in seeing humanity, that shifts the way that all of us show up in the world. That is so true. And as I used to say, where I come from, well, well, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, whew, I'm still feeling that energy and I hope all of you will too. Um, in the early days of the pandemic, Arundhati Roy said, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of prejudice and hate, our adverse, our data banks, dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So how do we together make the most of this portal, make the most of our ability working in stories, as Hannah reminds us, to build? We're going to be spending the rest of our session exploring and taking this wonderful ancestral energy that Hannah brought to us to look at what it means to be in the sacred time of reinvention and reimagination with some incredible thinkers and doers. So let's just get right into it. Uh, Jean Friedman Rodowski is the executive co-director, excuse me, executive director of Resolve Philadelphia. Resolve Philly. Hey, hi, Jean, how are you? Uh, you all work hi. in so many different communities. You address many of the systemic inequalities that Hannah sh uh, shared with us in her beautiful stories and poems. And through that, you all collaborate with a variety of organizations and different types of entities. I can just imagine while that is incredibly inspiring, it can also be draining and there needs to be opportunities to fill up your tank in the reserves. So I, I'm curious and I'm sure many other people are during this time in reinvention and reimagination, what are some of the ways in which Resolve prioritizes and really focuses on care for one another? Yeah, thanks for that question, Roxanne. And thank you, Anna, that was, an incredibly powerful way to, to start off this conversation, to start off this conference. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. I'm Jean. It would be wonderful to be with you in person, um, but I'm happy that you're there on the other side of the screen. Um, 
So to answer Roxanne's question, I'm actually going to start with a story. Um, and this story uh, begins about, uh, I guess, a little over a year ago. So in the fall of last year, um, you know, we were six, eight months into the pandemic. And a couple members of our team, our community engagement team, came to me and Cassie, my co-founder and co-director, and basically said, we're, we're not okay. Um, you know, they had been spending the summer and early parts of the fall um, out in the community building relationships. These were the folks who were kind of leading our new equally informed initiative, which is what we launched thanks to um, a grant from Independence Public Media Foundation early last year. Um, and the idea is really um, the, the charge that we had from them was to increase news and information access to those most vulnerable to uh, COVID and long term social and economic fallout. So, and we were doing this through text and place-based information delivery. So our team had been out at free food distribution sites where we were handing out our community newsletter. They were in neighborhoods all around the city with folks most directly impacted by the pandemic at play streets, just kind of, you know, spreading out and also trying to build relationships virtually. And it was just taking a toll on them, you know, mentally, psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, um, to be kind of so deeply rooted in the community and, and just feeling the, the challenges that everyone was feeling facing this collective trauma six months into the pandemic. So um, they came to us and said, we're not okay. And Jing Yao, you, one of our staff members who came to us said, I have an idea. I know this duo of social workers, clinical social workers who specialized in trauma-informed care. Maybe we could reach out to them and just see, see what we could do. What can we do to support ourselves as a team and also the communities that we're working with? So we reached out to Rebecca and Ibis, this team that makes up um, uh, Rebecca and Iris, sorry, IBIS Group is the, the name that they work under. Um, and IBIS planned a workshop for us, basically a training to talk about, you know, how to how to approach your uh, work from a trauma-informed lens. How do you care for yourself during that time? How do you care for the people that you're connecting with? It was great. Um, and so we then kind of moved forward with them. And over the course of the beginning of this year, they designed a um, stifo education workshop for our team where they dealt really deeply into um, into you know caring for yourself, caring for others, and how trauma affects the body, how it affects your brain, so that we can all be you know doing the work that we need to be doing from this really educated lens. Um, and we extended this to the newsrooms that we work with. And so we now run workshops for our Broken Philly, which is the um, collaborative reporting project, the Resolve Leads for all of the newsrooms involved in that. Reporters and editors um, have joined in on trainings on, on how to be more trauma-informed in their reporting and editing practices. Um, and we have we have um, IBIS groups sort of on a, on a consulting basis so that when members of our team, when issues arise and they want kind of a, you know, a, an, an expert lens um, on challenges, we have them who we can rely on. And so an example of that is um, Julie, our data and impact editor, came across a data set that was quite alarming to us that we felt like needed to be exposed. And also the information that was police data had the potential to really cause harm to the folks who whose lives it touched. And so we had a conversation with IBIS, how do we do this reporting with care, right? How do we expose what needs to be exposed and also try to keep those who are potentially harmed by this data safe? Um, so what this really has, you know, in addition to kind of trying to do this work, trying to think of more ways we can work with IBIS and, and kind of integrate this, this trauma-informed approach for our staff and for the newsrooms that we work with. It's led Cassie and I to really think about what if we reimagine journalism as a care profession? You know, what if we started rooting our practices and workflows in that philosophy to really think of ourselves as like our primary goal is to be here in service of caring of the communities that we are that we are you know, serving every day with our reporting and our engagement practices. Um, and I think that that has so much, there's so much power there in framing journalism as a care profession. Um, and so that's kind of, that's the journey that we are on. Um, you know, for, for the folks who are gathered here today, I would offer to you, what would it look like um, to think about your work if you started seeing your purpose as equipping and enabling care work to happen? 
how would that change your grant making? You know, how could a this approach not just sort of like reporters individually taking a more trauma-informed approach to their work, but thinking about our profession as a care profession, where could this take us? So that's some of the reimagining that we're doing here, um, you know, in the face of this pandemic through Resolve's work. I love that, Jean, and I know we'll be able to come back to lots of it, and I've enjoyed in the last couple of months dreaming around this with you and Cassie as well, and we definitely want more folks to join us in thinking about journalism as an active care, a care, community care profession. It really, really is. Um, I love to um, bring Sylvia Rivera the business strategist at the Listening Post Collective to join in on this conversation. Uh, hi, Sylvia. So good to see you. Roxanne. Now, the Listening Post Collective, you all have a really powerful vision for the future. And, you know, we're in this state of talking about reimagination and reinvention, and we need to know where we want to go, right, in the pursuit of all those things. And when you all talk about a future, you talk about it from the concept where civic power is strengthened, and the way it can be strengthened is through equitable civic media. And I was just wondering if you could kind of expand on that vision, and how do you think we can get there together? Thanks for asking the question, Roxanne. Uh, and everyone, it's an honor to have this platform and this opportunity to tell you about our work and to build community with you. Um, the Listening Post Collective is a project of Internews, an international organization that supports media in 100 countries, from radio stations and refugee camps to hyper-local news outlets. For over 40 years, Internews has worked with partners in the most vulnerable communities to provide people with quality local information that saves lives, that improves livelihoods, and that upholds democracy. Much of the work funded is funded by USAID's Democracy Rights and Governance portfolio, and it's treated as a humanitarian venture. And here's what we know from doing this work. The challenges of providing remote communities in South Sudan with vital access to news or in developing media literacy campaigns to fight misinformation in Ukraine aren't very different from the challenges that we face in cities like Fresno, Phoenix, and in New Orleans. Successful information and media solutions must be rooted in local needs, values, and capacities. And we've learned a lot since launching our first project in post-Katrina New Orleans. In 2013, we conducted our first US-based information ecosystem assessment with the public radio station. And we spent time building trust with community actors and developing relationships with community-based organizations. The end result was that we helped to develop a text message and listening post initiative that engaged hundreds of residents throughout the city. It was an exchange of news and information that the community actually wanted and needed. And since then, we've conducted dozens of information needs assessments in communities across the country and have even provided seed funding to groups with solutions to address those information needs. In Omaha, this helped launch NOISE, a Black POC-centric news initiative. In Oakland, this helped launch El Timpano, a two-way reporting platform that engages local, that engages local Latino um, audiences and immigrants with information about immigration, housing, health, and education. And in Fresno, this helped launch YouSpark, a digital platform that serves Latinx and Black millennial and Gen Z residents with information on public health, policing, employment, and government. These assessments have helped community leaders and journalists and independent media organizations understand their community needs more deeply and represent the expressed needs of their communities. And as a result of this deep listening, we've become very clear-eyed about the following. Media access is a public health issue. Media access is a workforce development issue. Media access is a social justice issue. And media access is a democracy issue. The Listening Post Collective wants to build a future where civic power is strengthened by equitable civic media and work with people and organizations to develop local news and information solutions that help communities thrive. And we're guided by principles that I think we can all share in. Listening is our greatest tool. Trust is earned. Cultivating local power is essential. Being adaptable and responsive strengthens collaboration. And equitable media requires culturally relevant solutions and transformative investments. And I want to reflect on that last point for a moment. In 2020, the Ford Foundation released a report called Investing in Equitable News and Media Projects. 
And in it, they call out that equitable media founders face a number of barriers when seeking early stage support, including bias, lack of networks, lack of early technical and business support, and lack of mentoring. As a project of Internews, the Listening Post Collective is committed to investing our time, talent, and resources to help partners work on some of these early stage challenges. But we're asking the funding community to increase its early stage and long-term investments in support of media leaders. And I just wanna crystallize our challenge. Sergio Cortez, the leader behind YouSpark in Fresno, recognized that young Latino Black, G, Black Gen Z residents were not engaging in local politics. They're the largest voting group in Fresno County with a bit over 172,000 registered voters but only 10% of them voted in the last election. He felt the urgency of providing his community with quality local information. And two years after launching, we engaged a consultant to measure the impact that USPARC has had on its community. And we learned its audiences rely on USPARC's reporting. In focus groups, community members share that USPARC not only informs them, but provides a clear information uh, on how to be involved in local government. Five of seven participants mentioned attending a city council meeting or Zoom session because of USPERC. So just imagine the domino effect of civic participation that this could lead to. And yet as great as this is, we still have to worry about whether Sergio can continue doing this important work because of the demands of building a civic media project are at odds with his needs to pay his bills. It's our belief that the people who are doing the most important work in vulnerable communities throughout the US have the least access to transformative investments. And Sergio isn't the only equitable media leader we know experiencing this challenge. And it's an unfair burden for these leaders to carry. So while we believe it's important that we test new revenue models built on community support, we should also be asking ourselves, what's the business plan for democracy? Where's the humanitarian aid to combat the vacuum that media consolidation has left us to fill? Where's the big funding energy for small news and information startups and communities historically excluded from mainstream media? We recognize that there isn't one tool, process, or approach in building news and information solutions, and there isn't one funding mechanism or approach to transform our local media landscape overnight. But here's a few ideas for you to reimagine your funding consideration. Uh, fund projects rooted in communities, information needs, fund equitable media leaders as fellows for democracy, provide them with multi-year salaries and project support so they can focus on their work and fund for the long game that recognizes that investments in media are investments in public health, workforce development, social justice and democracy. Um, I wanna thank you for listening and I look forward to today's exchange of ideas. Sylvia, thanks so much um, for bringing also the spirit of Sergio in the room. Uh, and what Eve Spark is doing and connecting all of this work to our global community. Uh, we are definitely going to be coming back to lots of points you raise, especially that notion of what's the business plan for democracy and how can we make sure folks can do this work with the same dignity and respect everybody um, deserves so we can all thrive. Thank you so much. Um, I like to bring up Jen Brandel. Hey, Jen, how are you? Uh, Jen is the co-founder of Zebras Unite, among other things, and I'm sure she'll touch upon that today. Um, Jen, you are a media and journalism entrepreneur and many times over, <laughs> I think we can all agree. And you've gone through a lot of the ups and downs. And while I was at Matter, um, used to call it the drunken walk, as you, you remember. Um, we've also had some really good conversations and organizing efforts together around how we can address capital systems that are lagging behind concepts like cooperative-based approaches or mutualism. And so I'm curious, you know, you've been on this journey and continue to be on this journey. Um, what are you and others who are part of Zebras Unite are seeing that's promising uh, for folks to be able to get involved in? Thank you so much, Roxanne. I'm thrilled to be able to talk about this from kind of two different perspectives, like you mentioned, one of being a, a media maker, a former reporter, and then a founder, and then now working kind of at one altitude or a couple altitude layers above as well around the structures and the financing. So like you said, Roxanne, um, the, the legal forms, the capital forms are the last to follow the cultural revolution. And I think we can all feel that that cultural revolution is upon us right now. 
And the faster we're able to meet the needs of those who are leading that charge, the, the faster the change will happen that we're looking to seek. So since I'm a visual person, I put a few slides together because um, I can't stay on topic without them, essentially. So I wanted to um, just share out a, a brief story to illustrate some of these questions that you asked and also to touch upon what we've heard already from Sylvia, Hannah, and uh, Jean as well. So I'm going to share a little bit of a background story of, of two entrepreneurs, myself and my colleague, uh, Mata Zapeta, around kind of our, our dream of trying to be zebras in a unicorn world, which I know sounds ridiculous, but all will be revealed shortly. Um, so Mata and I have remarkably similar career paths. Um, we both started as reporters, um, had kind of liberal arts, arts backgrounds, ended up going into incubator and accelerator programs, and launched companies that had uh, tech and some degree of scale, et cetera. And we were not interested in the venture capital route because it would compromise our values and, and our ability to really care for people in the way that we wanted. And we could not find allowing funding. Um, we were hanging on by a cliff as uh, seen here in the icon. Um, and, and we remain that way and right now. So what we started doing is trading notes about each of our companies and really reporting, doing what we knew, which was bringing back and publicly documenting kind of the roadblocks we were finding. And so in 2016, we collaborated on a post called Sex and Startups, um, which you can Google to find. There's lots of good uh, cheeky humor in there. But essentially, we were arguing that we don't need more players playing the same old game. We need new rules for winning because we kept hearing from different um, people wanting to fund. Oh, we would love to fund more women or BIPOC entrepreneurs, but there just aren't there. And we said, no, we're all here. We just aren't interested in the route that you've created. We want to create um, mutuality and a different value set, essentially, than what was available in strictly nonprofit funding or for-profit funding. And so in 2017, we, we went from complaining about the problem to offering what we thought were the seeds of, of some solutions, not to say that we're even close to solving for anything yet. Um, and we articulated things that I think we can all agree to now back in 2017, was, which is when shareholder return Trump's collective well-being, democracy itself is threatened. And the business model kind of is the message and it breeds behavior at scale. And so in this post, we kind of created a chart that helped to elucidate the values of unicorn companies. So, you know, the, the big companies that a lot of investors were looking to create that could be the next big media companies or, or whatnot. And these are the unicorns that could be valued at a billion dollars or more. And we created an alternative. So we, we chose the zebra as our mascot, really, because zebras thrive in cooperation. A group of them is called a dazzle, uh, which is a fun fact. Um, and really, we were looking at a very different why, a very different how, who the benefit beneficiaries were and how we got there. It was in direct competition with the current models that were available to us for funding, being founders of startups that had high growth potential. And so from there, we didn't know what to do. It's not like we had all the answers. And so we do what Harkin does as a company. We listened to the people who we were looking to uh, serve and partner with. And we created a conference in 2017 called DazzleCon, where we could really define what this movement was together and not have it be a couple of, you know, a few different leaders, but really be from the ground up. And for those of you with a keen eye here, you might see some media entrepreneurs who came like Carolina Guerrero from Radio Ambulante, uh, Sarah Alvarez from Outlier, Julia Kumari Drapkin from IC Change. So uh, we had great media representation there as well. And we also found the people who were attracted to the zebra model were overwhelmingly uh, not the typical entrepreneurs that you see. There were only 31% white male founders. The rest of the people there were underrepresented. And so people started noticing what we were talking about and what we were writing. Um, and we started to really define what zebra companies are. They balance profit and purpose. They champion democracy. They put a premium on equitable distribution of power, et cetera. And so this slide makes it look so easy that we created structures to support the culture, community, and capital for the next economy and for the kinds of companies Mata, myself, and our other co-founders were building. But this is uh, equivalent to many hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal work to create an infrastructure that matched the regenerative approach that we were looking to take. And so we've created a capital arm, a co-op, and a .org so that we could have the kind of system that would allow us all to benefit from one another, um, as well as chapters. We have more than 20 chapters around the world right now. 
And so I just wanted to point out two things that I can uh, share a uh, tweet about later, but two experiments that we've been running that I think journalism funders should study is exit to community. So what would it look like for media startups or current media organizations to not exit to a shareholder, but exit to whoever it is that they're serving? So for local news, their local community, et cetera. And we wrote a whole zine about this and had a peer learning group. And then there's also so many lessons from outside of journalism. Um, the Inclusive Capital Collective is a project we've incubated uh, around overcoming systemic racism through equitable access to capital. And we're starting with looking at real estate and what we can learn from the real estate industry with capital. Um, the last thing I'll say before a few different uh, or a few key takeaways is that what we're learning is that every time we go up a layer to say, okay, here's where the problem sits, we find yet another problem one layer above. And so really, uh, we're looking at governance, we're going all the way to how we decide what we decide. And we have at Zebras Unite um, circles, so it's kind of like sociocracy, holacracy as to how we model. We are not a hierarchical organization. And I think this is going to lead to, and it already has, radically different outcomes in process. And so Mata and I are still on this path right now to trying to create zebra companies with our two companies, which have since merged, and uh, we'll see what happens. So um, just wanted to point out a couple things in the paradigm shift here is that this has been said by others in the panel that just many experiments are needed and require funding for not just the project, but for a layer of infrastructure. So it's not even just general operating costs, it's about networking us to others as well. And we believe that emergence is way better than predefined outcomes in KPIs. So if in your applications for funding, you're not saying, how are you gonna change the world as it is, but what are you looking to learn? I think would be so much more useful for people to have that freedom to discover and, and find a new path. Um, also education for entrepreneurs and funders and investors on alternative models, processes, corporate forms is imperative because there's so many different creative things we can do out there, but we can't do it if we don't see them happening. Multi-year funding required, just don't assume all the folks even in this call um, have what they need to continue. And the process is more important, we think, at, at process, than product in this juncture. Um, and yeah, lessons outside of journalism abound. And just to respect, like Sylvia said, for the local context, the scale should not be king. <laughs> so that is a, that'll wrap up my moment here, but I'm so excited to hear from the rest of the panel and to engage in this conversation. Thank you so much, Jen, and thanks for helping us see how multi-layered all of this is and how policy, governance, and legal um, are a part of this along with capital, just as much as heart and culture, community, and story. Um, and I know many of the structures you raise, folks will want to discuss more in this forum, but also in the, in the future. Uh, last but not least, kind of in the similar vein of us thinking about the structures, making sure people's mindsets and hearts are ready. Um, I love to welcome Anita Zelina, who is the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism and many other things. I know you're involved given all the great initiatives that you have structured. Uh, Anita, um, you and I, and also many people on, on this panel, are, are great fans, and some of us have even studied uh, with Adrian Marie Brown. And in particular, um, we all enjoy the seminal text emergent strategy. I think almost everyone used either the word emergent or something or a cinnamon of emergent as they were sharing their ideas today. Um, there's a lot of richness in that text, uh, and in particular, how um, Adrian Marie Brown talks about the opportunity for us to see investing as a shared network of resources, right? And that when we think about a shared network of resources, what happens is we have a shift. We have a shift in how we move financial and human capital. And dare I say, always we start to think about value and resources. Uh, Anita, I, it would be great to hear a little bit more from you about how some of these ideas um, uh, have taken root in your work uh, at the Newmark School uh, as well as some of the other organizations uh, you're a part of. Thank you so much, Roxanne. And I'm like deeply honored to be part of, of that group. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so what I focus my work on with my team here at the school uh, and uh, working with other colleagues here is really uh, designing educational cohort-based learning experiences that are transformative, that are deliberately designed for maximum impact, that are focused on serving communities that are underserved, that haven't been in focus before, 
and one thing that we that we truly believe in uh, is that education can be can have such a transformative momentum and creating these educational spaces as trusted spaces and as safe spaces and being super diligent in the program design and curriculum design and super deliberate in how we built these experiences shows our appreciation as educators and as program designers to the communities we serve. So we are we are lucky enough to work with with many amazing funders, uh, Memphis, uh, Memphis being one of them, um, who make it possible for us to build those experiences. Uh, we run uh, programs that focus on uh, entrepreneurs of color in California, emerging leaders of color in Philadelphia. We in, in our programs, we have people who are trying to solve the riddle of how to serve communities across the border uh, in uh, Spanish speaking communities across the border in Arizona. Uh, we have people who tell the stories of uh, immigrants in Nepal. Uh, we have people who uh, tell the stories of black artists uh, in Detroit. And my, I made it my mission to, <laughs> to fundraise to make it possible to create these programs for them. And to, to your point, Roxanne, and so many amazing things have already been said on that panel that I can just completely follow. To your point about emerging strategies and collaboration, I actually, until a bit more than two years ago, I never even encountered uh, philanthropy in my life. I never fundraised. I worked in big corporate media in big management roles. And I quit this job to go to a public university and to build these, these experiences. So I encountered American philanthropy for the first time. So you might still say that I'm something of kind of an outsider in that, in that whole scene. So maybe that gives me a perspective that's a bit of an outsider's perspective um, on many things. And I will just share some things that have been, and I'll just say surprising to me or that I've been wondering over these past two years. And one of them is really building on the emergent strategy um, uh, focus that you just that you just mentioned, and one of the the thoughts that is recurring in in the emergent strategy work is that networks and collaboration are actually kind of our natural state of being, right? That networks and collaboration make us what we are as humanity. Now, one thing that we all know, working with the current system, is that the current system does not necessarily encourage collaboration neither collaboration amongst different grantees, nor collaboration between funders and grantees, nor collaboration, if we kind of complete the triangle, between communities, funders, and grantees. So one question that has been constantly playing in my head is how can we prioritize that collaboration? How can we prioritize uh, creating those network effects? And how can we tweak the system to build on Jen's point about you know, changing the system? How can we tweak the system so that it allows us to build on that collaboration and to build that network and encourage that network collaboration? The second thing that I'll say that I'm still uh, you know, struggling with, and I know many of us are, is how do we measure impact with something where scale is not necessarily the best way to measure? What new metrics, key performance indicators are there that are still tangible enough, because obviously, to totally understandable, funders want to see, uh, want to have a way to measure return in investment. How do you measure return in investment when that return is in community empowerment? What metrics are there and what metrics could we build that help us understand, did this program, did this initiative, does this organization empower the communities it wants to serve? And the third thing that I'll say is, Prioritizing inclusion and belonging in the spaces we built is something that's not naturally happening per default in the system. I, and I think that's basically, you know, when you use the word prioritization, prioritization means saying no to other things. Prioritization means saying no to opportunities that are not aligned with your mission-driven values. Prioritization means really centering the communities you serve as a funder, as a grantee, as a program designer. How can we put this prioritization in place and not just kind of have hope that the system automatically prioritizes for us? Because I don't think that's going to happen. 
So those are the three points. I'll keep it short because I look forward to our conversation so much. But these are the three points that I wanted to make. And if you want, I kind of put my outsider hat on and reflected on some of the learnings that I had over these past two years. We love all the hats you wear, Anita, mm -hmm. and very much appreciate uh, the, the questions that are really a provocation to call us into community because we need each other, as Hannah reminded all of us at the beginning of our time together, to be able to figure these, these different things out. Um, now that we're all around, I guess, the proverbial kitchen table, <laughs> um, there's so much um, gems and mic drops. Um, I want to remind folks who are watching us in our extended kitchen table, please share questions and reactions um, to what these amazing folks are doing in the community spirits that they've brought forth. We'll incorporate them uh, throughout the rest of our time together. Um, as you are reflecting and thinking about what you want to ask, um, I think I'll just kick off with a couple of things. Um, you know, we talk a lot about our, our work sometimes from these abstract standpoints, like you were saying, Anita, these KPIs, OKRs, um, we talk about it, to your point, Sylvia, from the standpoint of, you know, our city, our state is the most important thing, often very American, United States version of American centric without thinking about the world. To your point, Jean, we talk about uh, this as we are robots, right? We're not humans, we don't have feelings, we don't care, we don't need to care for each other. Um, and when we move into that mindset, we move away from what we fundamentally are, which is storytelling beings. So I just wanted to share a quote from one of the most prolific storytellers that we have ever had on this planet, Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison once said, our future is ripe, outrageously rich in its possibilities, yet unleashing the glory of that future will require a difficult labor and some may be so frightened of its birth, they will refuse to abandon their nostalgia for the womb. Um, I'm sharing this because I feel like all of you have touched upon what Tony has so beautifully put together for us. And I'm curious, and, and um, maybe Jean, we can have you start. What can be put into place to help us with this difficult labor? How can we help folks abandon their nostalgia or another way of thinking about it, the old approaches and mindsets that all of you have been pointing out to us today? Um, ooh, it's a big question. I mean, I think, you know, so first I'll just sort of frame this, which is probably what I should have done at the beginning. For those of you who aren't familiar with Resolve Philly, um, we are an organization that develops and advances journalism built on equity, collaboration, um, and the elevation of community voices and solutions. And we're based here in Philadelphia, and that's where our work is really rooted. But a lot of what we do is, is working kind of on a national level. So I'll just kind of put that, put that context out there. Um, I think and, and really at the heart of, of everything we do, we have three programs equally informed that I mentioned, Broken Philly Collaborative and Reframe, which is about um, framing and language. At the heart of everything that we do is about behavior change. Um, and how do we get journalists um, and you know those of us in, in this profession to be to be thinking differently, to be acting differently? Um, and also, you know, along with that, how do we how do we change the behavior? Um, you know, in a positive way of communities who have been, you know, long, long excluded or misrepresented, right? How do we kind of build back that trust? And so I think some of the lessons that we've learned um, over time with, with behavior change, um, because I think this is at the heart of, of Tony's quote of like, how do, you, how do you let go of the things in the past that feel so comfortable that you want to cling to just because that is what you know, um, is one that it takes time right? It is, it is about the long game. And I think all of us in some way touched on that and what we talked about. And I think, you know, the message there to funders is, you know, long-term funding. It can't be project-based. It can't be a year, you know, long-term funding and progressive philanthropy is three to five years. In conservative circles, it is 10 to 20 years, right? They fund ideas. They fund people who they think have promise and don't ask that much about outcomes, about KPIs. So, so it takes a long time. Um, it takes relationship building, right? You have to, what we 
what we know about human behavior, and I think this has, you know, absolutely borne itself out in the pandemic, is that is that you you trust the messenger, right? You have to to be able to, you know, believe something. Sorry, I hope you can't hear the loud noise in the background. Um, to be able to to want to change your behavior, you have to be working with someone that like makes you feel good about that change, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, you can't like drag people kind of kicking and screaming saying, no, 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 but this is the better way to do it. It has to be like a process. You have to show that you understand that, that desire to, to, you know, do the status quo and to do what you have always learned. And also the way that, that change can be for the better. So those are two things I would offer in this kind of like long journey of, you know, leaving behind the comfort of the womb and walking into something new. Lovely. And, and Jean, I, I appreciate in particular um, the note that you have raised for people to think about it from the standpoint of time and different time dimensions. And we've got to get on the same page, what we mean by time. And part of getting on that same page is having an understanding that change needs care change needs, maybe, dare I say, love. Um, you know, Hannah, I want to bring you into this um, because I know you have a deep love for Toni Morrison like I do. Uh, and the work that you do on the ground with communities, helping them reimagine and reinvent. I'm curious what you think needs to happen for us to be in a better position to step into these new ideas that many of the other panelists started to talk about. Um, something that, that I see often is uh, decision making that has not been made um, with the people who are at the center of, of those decisions in mind. So, so the people who need to be at this proverbial table are often not there. And you have folks oftentimes who are well-intentioned um, making decisions and choices, whether it be funding or programming or whatever, for, for folks that they might not need or even want or desire. And then you're investing in something that maybe you want for them, but they don't want for themselves. And it seems like such a basic and easy concept to, to think about, like go to the people who, uh, who, who need the thing um, and ask them what they want and need. I think um, Sylvia put forth like some real strong, like this is what we need and this is how you can do it. Like, Sometimes it feels like people are screaming from the top of the lung, their lungs, like, no, this, this is what our community needs. These are the things that we need to be able to, to tell the stories in a way that is impactful, that sticks, that lands, and, and sometimes that falls on ears that don't hear it. So I think um, really listening, I, I think that Sylvia, that was the first thing that, that you started with, with, with sort of your mandates. It's that thing of listening and understanding and then acting. Oh, that's so beautiful. I, I know we're all jotting things down because we're in community. I hope some of you out there are also jotting things down and drawing things and dreaming alongside with us. Hannah, I appreciate so much this reminder that the seemingly simple things are actually things that we need to develop a practice on. Mm -hmm. I also appreciate you calling this up into the context of humanity, right? We may say we are listening, we may say we understand needs and want needs, but if we don't see each other's humanity, and again, I'm gonna use the L word, and if we don't practice love, right? It doesn't matter how many studies one does, it's not gonna to come to fruition. Um, Sylvia, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but I would love for you to share again, some of those like bombs, those mic drops um, to get people into that right listening mode. Let's channel Sergio. Uh, you know, in, in channeling uh, Sergio, let me just also add that, you know, I, I feel the weight of his exhaustion sometimes. Um, I started doing this work over 20 years ago um, as well, working at a small community radio station in Chicago. And a lot of the very same questions that we're talking about today and the same issues are questions that I used to struggle with as a young equitable media leader um, in gaining access to funding in trying to make the case that my small audience numbers mattered, that my community was actually impacted you know, by the news and information that we were delivering. I can bump into people 20 years later 
and collect testimonials from how powerful the, the aspect of us being able to cure that news and information and train community members uh, in media literacy, the, the impact that that had on 20 years uh, 20 years later, and unfortunately, then it was very difficult to, to make that case. And so that that challenge that that Sergio faces today um, is the forevermore challenge. And so, um, you know, some of the questions that um, that I asked in in um, this presentation was again just thinking about, you know, it's it's important for us to think about the the new revenue models and, and the sustainability practices, especially built those that are built on community support. But as, as funders, you know, we need to ask ourselves, like, well, what's the, the business plan in democracy? These, these big provocative ideas of let's fund for 10, 20 years, you know, let, let's put that out there. You know, where, where is our humanitarian aid to combat this vacuum, this deep, deep vacuum that media consolidation has left us with and that has been filled by bad actors that has been filling our communities with misinformation and disinformation? We need that that big funding energy that funds the Aussies and like all of the these big startups of the world, um, and these small communities um, that are considered niche communities, but that are so that are holding up our democracy in many cases. Um, and so some of the, those funding ideas were, were being sure that we're funding projects that are rooted in communities' information needs. That we're funding equitable media leaders as fellows for democracy. That, that they're, they are doing the work for democracy and making sure that they can do this and breathe at the same time and do the work. Um, and, that, and that we should do this for the long game. I know that we're framing this as, as, a, long, uh, as a journalism and local news issue, but you know, making those connections of how this um, Venn diagram and connectivity between public health and workforce development and social justice and democracy, it's all connected. Um, and so the more freely you give, the more freely we fund these movements. Yeah, I, again, Sylvia, I love how you're helping people understand the interconnectedness of all things. I know sometimes it can feel very daunting to be like, there's this layer and this layer, and what about this and what about this? I always, to your point about breathing and um, channeling one of my teachers, Trisha Hershey of the Nat Ministry, remind myself that even though there are all these different layers, we have each other, right? That's why, why we have each other, right? And um, as I, I reflect as somebody who is humbled and privileged to collaborate with, with many of you through the vehicle, the Night Linfest uh, Local News Transformation Fund, we talk about journalism in a mutual aid stance, meaning that we understand that it's about the interdependence and, and that news and information is a form of solidarity. Um, I love that we're reminding people that solidarity is the answer, not worrying about the complexity, but seeing the simplicity uh, in each other. We've got a couple of folks sharing some questions um, in the chat platform, so I'm going to weave them in. Um, we got a question uh, around uh, models. So this person said they're curious how these models are beginning to influence as they put mainstream news. Um, do you all have any examples? Uh, and I know many of you work with um, larger legacy or as this person called mainstream news is part of uh, your practice. Maybe Anita, we can start with you. Sure. Um, see, the interesting thing is that we, <laughs> we humans love to put labels on things. Um, <laughs> and I, 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 one of my, my pet peeves is to try to, to unlabel, <laughs> to unlabel pre-made labels. Um, so mainstream news is not a homogenous mass of people and they're all the same and they don't care about communities. There are, there is like the, the whole breadth of humanity <laughs> exists in mainstream news. There are people who deeply care about the communities they serve, the stories they tell. There are people who are questioning um, the value creation uh, and impact measurements that are in place in mainstream newsrooms. There are leaders who are very self-reflected and very empathetic in mainstream newsrooms as there are in community media. So, so I think what, what, what I can say is that I think if our work focuses on the, the human being in question and focuses on supporting them and empowering them to be a more reflected, to be a better leader, 
to serve their communities better, to help build sustainable solutions for their media organizations, the whole system will benefit from this. Whether we support, whether this person in question right now works in a mainstream newsroom or community media. That being said, mainstream newsrooms, of course, have access to sources of capital that community media doesn't. So I do feel that it's our duty to prioritize community media, but I don't feel that we should completely I, I'm always a bit skeptical when when I feel people are like, oh, we just, you know, the, the, the old system is broken. Like the, 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 the legacy media is broken. Let's just get rid of it. And I'm like, there is a lot there to preserve. We need to change the system. But changing the system doesn't mean kind of throwing it, <laughs> throwing it away and, and just building everything from scratch. The thing is, what do we preserve? What values do we want to preserve? What practices do we want to preserve? But what values and practices do we radically need to change? And there are quite a lot of them, starting from uh, the way legacy newsrooms treat their, or sometimes their communities, to how they deal with diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's how I'd start to answer that big question. <laughs> uh, thanks, Anita. And also, again, folks, uh, there are a lot of wonderful gems and inadvertent strategic and community building exercises these wonderful speakers and storytellers are giving us. So please think about what are you preserving, right? What do you want to change? Wonderful prompts, right, to have a deep discussion. Uh, Jean, I would love to bring you in, uh, in particular with Reframe and the work that you all have been doing uh, with the growing members of Broken Philly. Yeah, so um through Broken Philly, which is this collaborative reporting project that Resolve runs, we're now in year three. Um, it is one of the like longest and largest local newsroom collaboratives uh, in the country. 27 newsrooms here in Philadelphia, uh, including the Inquirer and NBC. Um, and so, you know, these these models are absolutely like influencing mainstream, which I will put in quotes, um, newsrooms, legacy outlets. I think exactly to, you know, Anita said it perfectly, where it is it is very tempting to homogenize. It is very tempting to put labels when it's, it is individual human beings. And so the progress that we've seen um, at some of these legacy outlets is through people who deeply, deeply care about this work and who are committed to, you know, building the best version of the media outlets that they work in possible. Um, I'll give one quick example from NBC News. Um, they have, um, they've been a wonderful partner throughout and this year have really tried to like really go deep on their community engagement practices. Um, and so in some of the reporting that they're doing on Philadelphia's very acute um, gun violence crisis at the moment, um, rather than the sort of usual approach and doing a lot of the crime coverage and going out and sort of doing quick hits every time someone um, someone is murdered, they are trying very hard to build relationships within the community um, and do storytelling that is deeper and more impactful um, and more um, and that, you know, frankly, doesn't do as much harm as reporting that they realize they've done in the past. And so some of those processes have included just going out and spending time with community leaders and on blocks without cameras, without a script, not there to record, really just to build those relationships. And so, you know, it is, we know it's time consuming um, and we know that, that time is probably the most precious resource within a lot of these newsrooms. And so it's not, you know, happening on every beat or with every story, but I think slowly people are realizing the value of it. And I think it's there, there's sort of change that needs to also come at the top to be able to give reporters and producers the flexibility to spend their time not producing a story for an afternoon, because they know it's going to build a better result down the line. Yeah, Jean, thank you so much for uplifting so many important points. Once again, like we all need to have a better understanding of how we perceive and, and think about time, right? We're working on a lot of different scales and oftentimes we're not understanding them, right? And that leads to people feeling, again, to your, your point, Dean, like, like robots who are only focused on a, on a certain type of deadline, right? And similarly, as, as what was shared, um, Anita, with you is like, we have to see people for their whole selves and their whole humanity, right? Uh, instead of using these labels, or dare I say, getting into these binary constructs of you're good and you're bad, right? Because that's not going to lead us to where we need to be as Hannah's gorgeous story at the beginning reminds us of like the complexity of that celebration of Juneteenth on that such important road. Um, 
I, as we're waiting for folks to share other thoughts and, and questions, um, Jen, I wanna come back to some of the structural points that you were making around your own journey and what uh, Zebras Unite is trying to do uh, on an international level to help people maybe have less of the ups and downs that you and your, your co-founders like Mata have had. Um, both you and actually Anita, you touched upon this as, as well, um, this need to redefine resources and the allocation of those types of resources. Um, re is my favorite pre uh, prefix. I promise I'm not gonna ask each of you to share your favorite re word, but it is something really powerful. And so I was wondering, maybe starting with you, Jen, um, how can we help folks shift you know, our mindsets around like what is value um, and, and resources in a way that we can truly create media that again, is not only what a community needs, but more importantly, what is what I'm hearing from all of you allows everyone to thrive and, and show their full humanity. Such a great question, Roxanne. Um, I'm reminded of Adrienne Marie Brown in Emergent Strategy and this idea of things being fractal. And so you have something that is this one pattern at this scale, but it's the same pattern as you go out and out and out. And so I feel like on a newsroom level, when we're looking at that paradigm shift and that, that new thinking, we have to go from looking at the public as a consumer to a partner. So we need to then redefine what it is that we're optimizing for. So prior to the information and digital age, you know, newsrooms were optimized for speed, efficiency, and distribution. You know, how do we get our stuff out faster than our competition, fit into this box of two inches on the paper and do that? And then now we're in the information age where there's so much information. It's not about optimizing for speed. We don't need more. We need better and more accurate and more relevant. And so we need to optimize for trust and for relationships and for being relevant. And in order to do that, we need to listen to how we can be relevant. We can't just be on top of the hill saying, here's what we think you need to know public. We need to say, what is it that we can do for you and with you? What information do you need to do the job of a citizen in society? And so that's the change that Harkin is trying to help make within newsrooms is to start this public powered process where we start with, what do you not know that the newsroom can find out for you? versus here's what we think you need to know. And I think that same kind of like ground up needs to happen on the funder level, needs to happen on the capital markets level, that same listening to, okay, we're trying to solve a problem for entrepreneurs and media companies that are serving underserved communities. Instead of us designing all of these things um, from a distance and saying, here's the fund we're going to put together, how could funders instead go to the people who they're trying to serve and say, what do you need? Because right now they might not say, I need a $20,000 grant that's going to take me 10 hours of work to just justify my existence. They might say, I need to make my rent next month. <laughs> they might say, I need a week off or I need something different. And so if you start by listening, you're going to find radically different ways to serve the people who are doing the actual work. Um, and I think you'll start to look at it not just being a, a numbers game and a money game, you can look at the time, talent, and treasure is kind of the way we think about it at Zebras Unite. People can participate, of course, with treasure, which is money. And it's very, it's a blunt object that can be very useful, but there's also the investment of people's time and the investment of their insights that um, have a real monetary value that is really hard to capture, but we know is useful. And being in community with one another is the only way we start to grow the time and the talent that we have. So it's not just saying, oh, this newsroom has two people, so it can only create 20 stories a month. No, if you actually involve the community, you can create as many stories as the community is interested in investing with you. Um, so that's a lot, but I just, I just wanna say, I, I think all of these same lessons come down to some first principles around start with listening, respond, evolve as needed, and don't assume you have the answers. Lovely, Jen. And again, I know you all are out there making your mind maps, getting these things down so you can take that back, not into your quote unquote office, but as all of these wonderful folks have said, into the community. Um, I want to come back to um, something again that you all have all said, and maybe Hannah, we can start with you. Um, we have all used the term of phrase being in community, right? Um, and 
a lot of the things that, that we have been discussing today are things that folks are, have been dreaming about, worrying about, working on, um, and have said, yes, yes, trust. I've heard that word a lot. People talk a lot about trust. Oh, yes, needs. Yes, we need to listen and have needs. Um, can you all help folks understand when we say we are in community and when we're talking about first principles and building this capacity, what does that mean and what does that look like? Because I think it's confusing, given that some of the words, again, like trust, have been overused. Hannah, would you mind helping ground folks what it means to be in community and doing the work? Yeah, I, I, I can, can speak from my, my own experiences. And, and being in community for me in a way that works is um, being in community when times are good and when times are disastrous, right? So there, there are so many... Um, Many, there are so many organizations that I see that um, want to work in communities based off of statistics, numbers, um, optics, things of that nature. The, those are real things that we have to, to be willing to, to name um, because that exists, right? Um, and they're there when the, the, the time is to take the photos and to uh, write the stories or, um, and I see this from, I'm, I'm a working artist. So I see it from the artist standpoint as well. I've seen um, artists go into community and um, gather stories or take photos and, and put on huge exhibits and, and make money or, and get fame and all those other things. But those folks who still live in those spaces, who still work there, who who still have the everyday struggles and fears and also joys are still there. And oftentimes feel like they have been utilized for something, but not honored. And so I think um, I, to be in community with folk means to be in that community um, in, in times of good and in times of trouble. And in that community showing up for things that maybe um, you wouldn't otherwise show up for. It, it, it means going above and beyond. And I think that in doing that, it comes back to you. Like that's the way that we continue to show up for each other. Um, I, I think that the, the part that's oftentimes missed is the like, we really have to show up for each other in intentional ways if we want to exist in community. Thank you. And again, I will say like the people where I come from, well, well. Sylvia, <laughs> I would love to invite you into this. Um, it reminds me of some of the points that you were raising before. Again, make, help make, making sure that folks know this isn't about the photo op to Hannah's point, uh, and making sure that folks are challenging precedent and mindsets that are quite often, let's be real, grounded in white supremacy and other forms of oppression. Uh, Sylvia, please. Um, well, first of all, right on um, with everything that Hannah said and, and how she described uh, community building and being in community. Um, that's definitely the approach that, that we're taking. And, and we've recently made a decision that, you know, we won't um, spend time um, doing sort of the work of information ecosystem assessment unless we know we can spend at least three years in a community at minimum. Um, and we do that because we understand one, you know, we're in, in this sort of networking of community actors and, and, and making our, our presence known. We're, si we're sur surveying folks for their for community needs, understanding what the most pressing issues are, um, understanding how folks access information. But then we're also connecting community members to one another. Um, uh, I'm, I'm referencing, we're doing work right now in the Inland Empire in California. Um, and we've been there uh, for at least over a year. Um, we've talked to you know, close to 100 um, community folks, um, folks working in community-based organizations, media leaders, um, just people on the ground uh, just doing good work. Uh, we've been surveying uh, just the community at large. We've done over 300 surveys in the community, um, just collecting information on community needs and information. We've also been uh, conducting community programming uh, media literacy, civic literacy programming in partnership and designed in partnership, you know, with, with the folks on the ground, uh, making sure that, um, that we're showing up for folks and that we're showing up for them uh, in the way that they expect us to. Um, in addition to all of this, this thinking and, and surfacing about 
um, you know, what the most pressing community issues are, um, what the best way to, to connect and reach folks are. We're in the process of, uh, we've, we've designed an RFP that basically invites the community to propose their ideas for community information um, solutions based on our findings um, with, res with a research uh, and assessment report that we've shared with the community at large. The community is going to design its, its, its uh, news and information platform. We're gonna support them and then we're gonna do the mentoring. We're gonna do the early uh, business development and capacity building. We're gonna do all of those things on the ground, but we know it takes time. Um, and to Hannah's point, you know, we're, we're not just dropping in and saying, hey, we did this report. We're dropping in and we're spending time folks and we wanna make sure that this is uh, successful, that people feel good about the work um, and that long after we're gone, that there's a network and an infrastructure and an ecosystem that relies one another. Uh, we, we were merely um, curators and partners in, in that experience and, and helping strengthen that. Um, and so that's that's the approach that 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 we've take um, because we're we're being super mindful of the fact that, um, that you know this happens in a lot of spaces. You know, uh, you drop in, you forget about folks, and um, and that's not the 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 type of relationship we want to have with the communities that we work with. That's right, because people always remember how you make them feel. Um, I know we could continue. Uh, to share, and I know we actually do outside of this forum, or in because we are in community with each other. But maybe we can close with this one last question, um, and and maybe we can briefly see how many of you can respond. Remember briefly, uh, what are ways other than grant making uh, that funders can really show up, can be true allies, comrades, partners? Uh, with their grantees. Remember, we're not talking about binary constructs. We're 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 in this together. So please give some advice to the to the funders who are joining us. How can they be allies, comrades, partners with you all? I can share some thoughts if that's okay. I'd say uh, so. Two things come to mind specifically. One is don't underestimate the, the power of being the first funder. I think uh, being the first funder of whatever initiative, whatever newsroom, whatever program, that sends a signal to other funders. And sending that signal, not just once with the kind of press release you do in the beginning, but sending that signal by showing up and vouching for the greatness of your investment, if you wanna put it that way, like praising and explaining why you invested, I think is something that isn't done often, maybe because it feels like bragging or something, but can be tremendously powerful. So I feel like just this showing up and spreading the word and encouraging other funders to say, well, we took the leap for you guys. We kind of took the first leap. So your kind of leap of faith is going to be a tiny bit smaller than ours. So you so don't fear. <laughs> I think that's something that can be super powerful. Thanks, Anita. Other thoughts? How can folks show up for you all? Ned, one brief thought. I think just as Anita said, thinking a little bit outside the box. In addition to grants, what else? Right? Like. What are some other really innovative ways that you guys can show up? I'll give one real quick example. Um, we are like at Resolve putting together, um, we're building a tech tool. We have been building it. We need to get it to the next phase. We are working with um, a group that is doing uh, an impact investment, raising capital for an impact investment for us. And so we've been discussing with a couple of funders, creating basically a backstop, a guarantee on the investment that we're getting, which is gonna allow the terms of the investment to have much lower rates um, of interest that we're going to pay when we eventually pay it back. And so it's a way of leveraging your capital without actually spending money, right? Because unless we completely fail, which, you know, we're not going to do. And so the idea of like, how can you use the funds that you have, particularly the endowments that are sitting there to help move forward new business models and to help be supportive of your grantees other than grant making. These are gems, folks. Please listen. 
Yeah, I'm going to add to that, Jean, since I've been um, with Zebras Unite, we've been working with inclusive capital innovators from around the U.S. on just different models. So I think funders can start to educate and learn about things like character based lending. So how do you think about ways where you can continually have money available to grantees that they can pay back in different ways or looking at a loan loss reserve or a credit enhancement facility for uh, you know all the folks you're trying to work with that can't get a regular bank loan when times are tough and cash flow is, is hard. So I think there's just um, a lot of rich um, ways that you can look at beyond uh, giving a, a grant for some period of time that meets with one strategic plan, but uh, to the point that many have been making, just thinking longer term, how do you make Make sure these innovators, as we've all seen in the last couple of years, especially last year, don't burn out and don't leave the industry because that is um, that's a real risk from everyone who's doing this work trying to juggle a million things at once. Absolutely, I'm getting the uh, Apollo hook <laughs> as we have to close. So I would say, please, if you're not already following these folks, please uh, follow them. I know Sylvia will uh, send out some more of her thoughts in addition to um, what she shared directly to you as funders in her opening talk. Um, so activist, author, and scholar Grace Lee Boggs once said, you can't change society unless you take responsibility for it, unless you see yourself belonging to it and responsible for changing it. Um, we sincerely hope that the stories, poetry, discussion has helped to fortify you in taking responsibility, has given you a deeper sense of belonging, and has furthered your understanding of our collective responsibility to change society. Um, please send uh, your warm thanks and greetings to these incredible storytellers uh, and speakers, and I will turn it over to Feather Houston to wrap us up officially. Thank you, Roxanne. <clears throat> Jean just made the point that in times of stress and challenge, we often hear think outside the box. Roxanne, you and your panel just totally blew off the walls of the box. Um, what a great opening session for this, for this period in our times, as you so happily call it, reinvention and reimagination. And Hannah, thank you especially for bringing synchronicity to our hearts and brains. Thank you all very much. Now we have a program pause here until two, but it's only for those who want a complete break. Uh, we also have a great pre-recording on offer until two. Sarah Alvarez and uh, of Outlier Media and Dick Tofel, uh, recently retired founding general partner of ProBublica, discuss the challenges and lessons they've learned in rebuilding local news. At 2 p.m., please rejoin for the, the concurrent sessions You'll find Zoom links for all the sessions in the swap card agenda. And thank you once again, Roxanne, Hannah, and your partners in the panel.